Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever increasing world feast. I'm excited to welcome you, friends and family, right here on Facebook, YouTube, and all our social media handles. Abel Damina is my name. Listen, the truth of the word of God is when God's word is preached and taught, God's power to save is made available. Brother Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I'm honored to serve you grace today to bring you clarity of teaching from the word of God. Invite a friend, a loved one, create watch parties, tag people because the word is going to come very hot and powerful today. You know, there's a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate in mind that this message is coming to you right now. It will change your life forever. However, remember the scripture tells us the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. The Greek word hugaino wholesome doctrine. There's an endurance required. So as you listen, please painstakingly and patiently listen to the teaching of God's word. Don't listen with a critical mind. Listen with a mind to learn. You know, Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest. So there's a meekness required. Brother James says, with meekness, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. There's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So you want to patiently follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series. So get ready to follow. And if there's anything you don't understand, be patient. The teachings will continue to explain themselves until you come to a place of understanding and clarity in the knowledge of Christ. One more thing to say with you today. If you're in an area where there's no Bible teaching church, where the message of Christ like this is preached, you can start one or you can join any of our campuses. Our campuses are extension houses of our local church where brethren come together and they are fed, they are taught, they take responsibility, they pray together, they reach out to the people in their community with the truth of God's word. Our campuses are lighthouses in nations and cities and communities where believers come together and they are taught the word of God by myself. And I'm excited if you want to be a part of what we're doing around your community or you want to start one. All you need to do is shoot me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we shall guide you on what to do to either begin one campus or join another. It's not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says, do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. In prophecy, the word of God tells us that God will bring the solitary into families. You are a member of a family and there is no family that does not have a gathering. Our gathering is our assemblage to be taught, to be equipped, and to become responsible for other people's growth. It's so important, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. Lastly, there's a plethora of books I have written that addresses so many issues of the Christian faith. They're all on the screen. Look at this. Today, you can order for a book or two or all the set by shooting an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Including today's message, you can order for the CD or the DVD. The entire essence is to nourish you, enrich you, and equip you with robust understanding of your relationship with Almighty God. I'm excited to be able to serve you. Fasting your seatbelts. Let me take you right now into a gospel adventure, into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. Glory to God. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. We've been dealing with the revelation of Jesus Christ as we uncover Christ in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So everything we're going to be studying in the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now remember that the revelation of Jesus unveils the identity of the believer. You will never know who you are till you know who Christ is. In Christ, the believer is revealed. The revelation of Jesus not only reveals the identity of the believer, it unfolds the capacity of the believer. It is only when you know who you are that you will know what you have. And let me tell you this very importantly. 
You can never know what you can do till you know what you have. So everything is rooted in the revelation of Jesus. When Christ is revealed, the believer in him is unveiled. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John. So the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now pay attention. Now John begins this book by establishing doctrine. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ who is a faithful witness and first begotten of the dead. So he already tells you that the revelation of Jesus you're going to be studying in the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus, the first begotten from the dead, the prototokos, the prototype of the new believer or of the new creation. What he's simply saying is that the revelation of Jesus we're going to be exploring in the book of Revelation is not the incarnate Christ, it's not Jesus of Nazareth, but the risen Lord, the exalted Lord, and the glorified Lord. So that's why he calls him the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prototype of the born again man and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood and hath made us, take note of the tenses, hath loved us, hath loved us, hath washed us, hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen so he now establishes the position of the believer first of all before talking about anything else he says it is you that have been loved have been washed and has been made a king and a priest unto god the father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen this is similar to all the apostolic letters John firstly spoke about what Christ has done for them and the reality of who they are in Christ and gave instructions about their conduct. That's why verse 4 and 5 and 6 cannot be the visions and imageries with the involvement and interaction with angels. Because verse 4, 5, and 6 are doctrinal teachings. He just pulled it out of the scriptures, the position of the believer in the finished work of Christ. All right, so now John saw, had, and wrote about. Rather, verse 4 and 5 has nothing to do with the visions he saw and heard and wrote about. It is gotten from the understanding of the Old Testament books of the Bible. So whatever John is saying in chapter 1, verse 4, 5, and 6, which lays the doctrinal framework to all he will be saying in the other chapters, begins with what Christ has done in the believer. Same way Jesus taught in Luke chapter 24, verse 25. Then said he unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now look at the way Jesus will teach next verse. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Pay attention. Verse 44 of Luke 24. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened it their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. Now, watch that. Watch the way Jesus will teach. He goes back to the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, and brought his revelation out of those books. But now, Jesus taught from the Old Testament, from the scriptures. He taught from the scriptures of the prophets. Romans chapter 1 verse 1. See the way brother Paul will put it. Paul a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, verse 4, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. 
So clearly, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 to 6, is the revelation of the scriptures. And what is the revelation of the scriptures? The revelation of Jesus Christ. They spoke concerning him. It is his message. The message of the Christ. But Revelation chapter 2 and 3, inclusive of the other chapters in the book, are revelations via the gifts in the spirit. So thus far, it suffices to say that the revelation of the scriptures weigh more than visions and utterances. Therefore, in Bible teaching as laid down in the epistles, and also seen in Jesus' example in Luke 24, 25 to 27, 44 to 45, visions and revelations must be established on the revelation. On the revelation. The reading world. In essence, to properly understand chapter 2, 3, and the letters to the churches, given via visions, utterances, and interaction with angels, it is necessary to firstly understand the revelation, the gospel of Christ Jesus, which John explained in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 to 6, and in all his other letters, all the other letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Now, this is the sole reason for errors, beliefs, and practices by some believers. All the erroneous beliefs and practices by some believers is that they study chapter 2 and 3 among other things. Without first of all understanding Revelation chapter 1, chapter 1 verse 1, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6. Which lays the frame foundation for what he will be saying in chapter 2, chapter 3 and all the other chapters. Now therefore in studying the book of Revelation, in studying the book of Revelation. The moment the visions, the utterances, and interaction with angels contradicts the written word, we are at liberty to discard them. Now look at what brother Paul will say instructively to the church in Galatia. It speaks volumes. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 to 8. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. In verse 8, brother Paul begins to warn sternly about the involvement of angels in the preaching of the gospel. Notice, he included himself. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. In other words, it can be preached by legitimate ministers of the gospel. It can be preached by legitimate ministers of the gospel. The word remove was translated from the Greek word metatithemai, which implies to change sides, to take away from a fixed position. You are being removed from him to take away from a fixed position. So brother Paul in the same letter begins to admonish in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. He admonishes the brethren in Galatia to stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Notice the tenses. Hath made us free. Hath made us free. If you observe the tenses of the gospel. Hath loved us. Hath washed us hath made us. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 to 6, now he says, hath made us free. The liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. So that means the tenses of the gospel of Christ, the grace of God in Christ, is what God has done in Christ. However, another gospel tries to change it subtly. It's like Christ plus circumcision. Christ plus obedience to the law of Moses. Christ plus seed sowing. In fact, recently somebody will say, Christ plus, if you don't pay your tithe, you will not make heaven full stop. All of that is another gospel. Christ, anything that adds to the finished work of Christ, you didn't hear me, anything that adds to the finished work of Christ 
is another gospel because jesus did an absolute perfect job on our behalf we couldn't that's why he came if we could he doesn't need to come if your fasting could do it he doesn't need to come if you could have done it he doesn't need to die he died because you don't have the wherewithal you lack the ability you lack the resources so in your place he died it is called the substitutionary sacrifice he took my place i take his place if you could do it there'll be no need for jesus so he died in my place so i can live in his place that's why brother john will say when christ who is our life he is our life without him we have no life so any gospel that has a plus to the finished work of christ is another gospel the word another gospel was translated from the greek word heteros which implies different altered or strange an altered version of the gospel a strange gospel you know a different gospel a gospel that capitalizes on human effort human contribution morality humanism motivation a gospel that puts the spotlight on man and not on christ the gospel of christ the spotlight is on christ because it's no longer i that lives but christ so any gospel that focuses on what man can do to qualify is another gospel it's another gospel because there's nothing any mortal man is capable of contributing and nothing any mortal man is capable of doing and nothing any mortal man is capable of presenting that satisfies you know perfection god is perfect so and you cannot please perfect only perfect can please himself only perfect can please himself so into context if we bring all of that into context watch he says another which is not another the word another was translated from the greek word alos which implies another of the same sort another of the same sort so when we bring all into context paul explained in galatians 1 6 to 9 that the strange gospel was not another of the same sort rather the strange gospel was a different sort of what they had received a different sort of what they had received when somebody says well i know you're born again but in order for the born again to be complete you have to fast and pray that's another gospel that's another gospel it's like somebody says well i know you're born again but in order for you to be truly born again you must abstain from meat sacrifice to idols you must circumcise that's another gospel the gospel thrives and is predicated on the complete total absolute finished work of christ it is predicated on that so he says but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of christ in verse 7 of galatians 1 the word trouble was translated from the greek word taraso which implies to steer or agitate to steer or agitate it was used 17 times for information received by sight or hearing that causes a steering or an agitation you will find that in matthew 2 3 when herod the king had these things he was troubled agitated you will also find it in matthew the same word applied in matthew 14 26 and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea they were troubled saying it is a spirit and they cried out for fear they were agitated so any gospel that agitates your salvation is another gospel pay attention the word pervert was translated from the greek word metastrepho which implies to transmute or corrupt in this context it will imply a corruption of the gospel of christ how do you corrupt the gospel of christ when you take human efforts to qualify the finished work of christ that's a corruption that's a transmutation that is a perversion of the gospel of christ there be some that will trouble you the word trouble means to unsettle to make you to lose confidence to create anxiety 
panic and the need to do something where salvation is concerned. This is a major talking point because one of the very noticeable traits is the major damage another gospel does by disturbing the believer's assurance and rest in Christ's work. It makes him feel insecure and creates the need in his mind to please God. So it agitates you, agitates your position. You know, statements like, my prayer is after all these things we are doing, you will make heaven at last. That's a mental agitation. What they are telling is that your salvation is not yet complete until you make heaven at last. Friends, Christianity does not have uncertainties. Christianity is a relationship with God that comes with a blessed assurance. It does not have uncertainties. It's not, you know, we're in a journey to heaven and we don't know who will get there until we get there. No, 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 no. Christianity has a closure in its faith that once you believe, you are saved. You are saved the moment you believe the gospel. You are saved. It's not until that day. He that believeth not is condemned already. Is condemned already. John 3, 16 and 17. So there's a closure to the work of salvation and a security to that work guaranteed by the Sota who gave Soteria. His name is Jesus. Notice, it is not Christ that is troubled. Because his work for us is done. Rather, the believer. And the result of another gospel is that it leaves the believer thinking more should be done. And this, another gospel perverts the gospel of Christ by changing its narratives. Instead of finished work, it becomes a work that is not yet finished until I add my quota. Instead of the finished work of Christ, it makes what Christ did a bad product. A bad product that is dependent on my contribution to be perfect. So it is casting an aspersion on the finished work of Christ. Another gospel subtracts from the finished work of Christ. Another gospel renders the finished work of Christ ineffective, devoid of my contribution. Which makes what Christ did look like it was a quack job. It's an insult on the work of redemption. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing any man is capable of contributing to what deity himself has done for man. Nothing. There's nothing anybody can add to what Christ has done. He did a great job. He did a perfect job. He did a complete job. And it was done once and for all. Glory to God. But another gospel casts it sounds nice to the humanistic mind, but it is a minus to the redemptive sacrifice. It's a minus to the finished work of Christ. It changes the narratives of the gospel, another gospel. And brother Paul says, such a person should be a cause. Verse 8, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The word accursed was translated from the Greek word anathema. It implies to ban, to excommunicate or separate from. And Paul's instructions were very clear. He didn't mean word. Any teaching, any message by a minister of the gospel or visions and interactions with angels that twist the facts of the gospel of Christ and unsettles the believer's assurance in what Christ has done, must be separated from, rejected, and refused. It doesn't matter how long that preacher has been in the ministry. It doesn't matter how great that preacher is. Any gospel that changes the narratives of the finished work of Christ must be separated from, must be rejected, and must be refused. It's similar to what Brother Paul will say, you know, uh, to the church. He says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. So there is another Jesus. Whom we have not preached. Take note of the tenses. 
or if you receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted you might well bear with him the word preacher was translated from the greek word keroso it means to announce or publish but take note of the phrase you might well bear with him it was translated from a compound greek word anekomai a-n-e-c-h-o-m-a-i it implies to hold oneself up against it implies that there must be a stern opposition against the preaching teaching and reception of another gospel another jesus another spirit some of you sometimes the way they try to deceive you is that you go there they do everything else then they use the name of jesus to brand it and somebody said but the spirit was moving people were falling all the benches were breaking you need to find out which spirit another spirit so that means even when another gospel is preached you will see a movement of the spirit you will see things that look like a demonstration of the spirit but you won't need to find out what spirit is in operation there is another spirit there is another jesus and there is another gospel and how to be saved is to stay with the teaching that sticks to the narratives of the finished work of christ don't be flabbergasted by people falling don't be intimidated by people vomiting vomiting is a medical condition don't be flabbergasted by all the drama and the action and the activity what we have from god is his word the totality of the revelation of god is communicated via words via words not drama not entertainment all of god's revelation to man is communicated via words so what we have is the written word the written word that's the first thing we have fundamentally and the spoken word the written word the spoken word not drama and it is in that word that the action of god is found he sent his word his word healed you see that the lord was working with them confirming his word with signs and wonders so always when the word is taught sound word is preached there is a backing of the spirit to confirm the word so how do i know if it is another jesus another spirit or another gospel what are the narratives of the teaching forget about the drama forget about the activity go for the doctrine the teaching the message the message because what we have in christianity is a message don't forget i said this some time ago miracles are not exclusive to christianity oh there are other faiths uh, if you want to see a lot of this go to india where they have millions of gods where they have all kinds of things in asia you see all kinds of things magicians diabolical men so that there is so-called miracle in a place it's not a sign that the gospel is preached the gospel is news that which is heard that which is heard that is in consistency with the written word beginning from moses and all the prophets see he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself that's critical that's very critical friends because if you don't get this you can easily be deceived so the written word or the gospel is the revelation the written word or the gospel is the revelation and the written word remains the basis why a vision or trance or interaction with angels will be accepted or refused remember brother paul said though we or an angel from heaven preach anything than that which is written let him be an anathema let him be cut off let him be cut off all right now please remember all true teachings all true teachings must affirm the past tense of his work upon which all things we do derive its legitimacy all true teachings must affirm that 
That's very, very emphatic. Very emphatic. Look at Galatians chapter 1 verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So in essence, every vision, book, movie, testimony, doctrine, interactions with angels that lacks the all-important permanent assurance of the eternal nature of Christ's work can safely be termed another gospel. So therefore, in studying Revelation like we are in the process, which has a heavy involvement of angels, images, and figures of speech, the litmus test in agreeing with what was seen, heard, and written by John will be the written world. That's our yardstick. Everything John saw, everything John heard, and everything John must have seen must agree with the scriptures, which is the written word of God. For example, Revelation 22 verse 6 to 11. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard them and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then said he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now, the person speaking clearly is John. Because with the understanding of the epistles, the epistles which are the revelation of the scriptures, it's not possible for Jesus in person to have uttered verse 11. Hear the way verse 11 sounds. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is whole, filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. That's not Jesus. Because even John, in the synoptic gospels, in his account concerning Jesus' words on salvation, this is what John even recorded. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There's a closure. He said, once you believe, you are saved. He didn't say that is unjust, let him be unjust. No. He didn't say, let he that is filthy, let him be filthy. He says, there's a closure. Once you believe, you are saved. Now, please pay attention. So the epistles, therefore, explains to us why the angels spoke the way they spoke in Revelation. The epistles will unveil to us the position of the angels. Don't forget, Brother Paul already puts a limit on the operation of angels. He says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other thing to you than that which we have preached in the epistles and in the scriptures, or the epistles taken from the scriptures, let him be accursed. Don't forget that. Now, so the epistles explain why angels talk the way they talk. First Peter 1.10 Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ 
which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Pay attention. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, which the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. That statement by Peter simply means that the angels are learning. They desire to look into. Being angels, the angelic world is still learning. They never had an understanding of the promise of God that was fulfilled in the resurrection and exaltation of his son. The angels never had that understanding. All right? So see the way Brother Paul will support what Brother Peter has just said concerning angels. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God and created all things by Jesus Christ. Pay attention to verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers, talking about the angelic world, in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The angels are to be taught by the church. Please pay attention. The manifold wisdom of God. So, it is the church that makes known unto angels the manifold wisdom of God. Not vice versa. Today, angels are learning about God from the church. Of course, the church of Christ Jesus is the school of angels. That's why whenever we gather to worship, among us there is an innumerable company of angels. Why are they among us? To learn from us. God does not share his deep thoughts with servants. Angels are servants. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. Are these not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? They are servants. Angels are servants. So God does not share his deep thoughts with servants. The only way servants can hear the thoughts of God is by hanging around sons. We are the sons of God. Oh, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, because we are the sons of God, we have access into the deep things of God. So angels learn from us. Pay attention. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them whom he loves. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God are revealed to sons. All right? That said, that said, that's why Jesus never mentioned angels, neither the apostles. Because in Luke 24, 25, 26, 27, it was beginning from Moses and all the prophets that he expounded. All that Jesus taught, he quoted from the Old Testament. The epistles were drawn from the Old Testament. The only book where there is a heavy involvement of utterance, visions, divinely granted appearances, where there is a gift of utterance that is not taken from the Old Testament books called the scriptures, is the book of Revelation, where caution has to be applied. Because Brother Paul already said, though we are an angel from heaven, teach any other thing. And now we have seen that angels are still learning. Now that's why Brother Paul will warn in his epistles concerning the worship of angels. Colossians 2, 18 and 19. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which are not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, 
and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have the nourishment ministered and knit together increase it with the increase of God. So the angels do not have the right utterance or understanding of salvation. So they desire to look into salvation. That's why they are being schooled and trained by the church. This explains why that book is full of imageries, figures of speech. And this explains why if it is not carefully taught, it could come with grave consequences. The epistles, in, on the other hand, we are written with great plainness of speech. No parables, no ambiguity, no parables, no ambiguity, no symbols, no figures, you know, no scare, no shadows. The epistles are written with great plainness of speech. Nothing mysterious in the epistles. Everything God wants us to know has been revealed to us in the epistles. Now that's why brother Paul will say in Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation. So the preaching of Jesus Christ that brother Paul preached was according to the revelation of the mystery. The Old Testament is called the mystery. So brother Paul's message came from the Old Testament revealed. That's why the Old Testament is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. Plainly, clearly, no ambiguity. According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Verse 26. But now it's made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Please pay attention. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2, brother Paul continues to establish his position. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is giving me to you what? How that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read... You may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. My knowledge, so what I wrote is my knowledge revealed to me by the Spirit in the mystery Old Testament of Christ. Please, that's important. In the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Look at another witness of brother Paul in Colossians 1.25. Whereof I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. That is the revelation, the ultimate revelation of the mystery of the Old Testament. That one day God will make man his heaven. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I will live in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God. They will be my sons and daughters. Glory! That dream of God has been fulfilled in that Jesus rose from the dead. So today we have the Father and his family. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. God has set forth the spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba Father, that dream, long-standing dream of God, to be a father to his family and live on the inside of his sons has been fulfilled in the resurrection of Christ. Glory to God. So now, any message not written, any message not well explained in the epistles is another doctrine, another gospel, even if it was revealed by an angel. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8, Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a cause. Verse 6 says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you 
into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. The Greek word is hetros eugelion, H-E-T-E-R-O-S, E-U-A-G-G-E-L-I-O-N. In First Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, see the way brother Paul will instruct Timothy. Unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mayest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That is a word to be underlined. Teach no other doctrine. He throws the descalio. Teach no other doctrine. H-E-T-E-R-O-S-D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-E-O. He throws the descalio. In First Timothy 6, 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to hold some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Revelation 5.5 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. That statement, Lion of Judah, obviously was not by the Spirit of God. Because no apostle in the epistles, in speaking of the resurrected and exalted Christ, use such appellations. No apostle in any of the epistles. And remember, the book of Revelation is not about the incarnate Christ from Judah. It is about the risen, exalted, glorified Lord from the dead. So, when this elder described Christ as lion... In his resurrection, he's not from Judah. He's from the dead. <laughs> the incarnate Christ from Judah died and lost that position. He was the only begotten son. John 3, 16. When he rose from the dead, he was no more the only. He rose from the dead as the first begotten. So when he rose from the dead, he didn't have that appellation anymore as somebody from Judah. Moreover, he's not a lion. He's the lamb. Alright? So, the Lord is not from Judah. Any reference to the Lord from Judah is historical. That's why Hebrews 7.14 will say, For it is evident that our Lord sprang. That's where he came from, origin. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. But when he rose from the dead... Even in the revelation by John in the book of Revelation, upon his resurrection by the apostles, he is called the firstborn or the first begotten from the dead. From the dead, not from Judah, from the dead. This is reality to us that our Lord is the risen Lord from the dead. That our Lord Jesus is the risen exalted glorified lord glory to god that's our reality okay romans 8 29 see the way it's written in the epistles for whom he did for know he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the first born among many brethren colossians 1 18 and he's the head of the body the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, church of the prototokos, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten, firstborn, first begotten from the dead. Friends, Christianity is an apostolic faith. Christianity is an apostolic faith, not based on visions and revelations or interaction with angels. Christianity is an apostolic faith. It is drawn from apostolic teachings. Remember, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the head cornerstone. So our faith is an apostolic faith. 
Our faith is not a faith that is derived or built on visions, dreams, revelations, or interaction with angels. Our faith is derived from what has been laid because no other foundation, brother Paul will say, no other foundation can be laid than that which is already laid, Christ Jesus. Please, that's important. So the faith or the doctrine upon which we base our belief has been delivered to us. Our faith is that which the apostles of the Lamb has delivered to us. All right? Look at it in Jude 1, 3 to 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So the scriptures only were given to us for evidence. The scriptures only, not visions, not revelations, not dreams, not interaction with angels, are given to us for our evidence. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, which is evidence for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So in studying the book of Revelation, therefore, it is imperative to tread cautiously and separate the things angels said and the things John saw from his explanation, the author, which he drew from the scriptures. I said all I said to say, from the analysis, therefore, following the key factors to note as touching how the book of Revelation was written, which will also serve as a guide in this learning, let's look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace, peace unto you from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Take note of this. Number one, it was written by John. Number two, it had the involvement of angels. Because there he said, he sent and signified it by his angels. Okay? So it had the heavy involvement of angels. Number three, it was shown him. It was shown, that which was shown to him. Which means... It came via a vision to show his servant, to show his servant. A divinely granted appearance. These are the facts to note. Number four. So the book will be characterized by imageries, symbols, and figures of speech. Because it came from a vision and angels are involved. So look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 to 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Who bore record of the word of God. And of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And of all things that he saw. Verse 10 to 12 of chapter 1. I was in the spirit on the last day. And heard behind me a great voice. As of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, 
and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Simna, Pergamos, unto Tetra, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlestick, verse 17 to 20. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So he wrote to seven churches. Those whom he explained to from verse 5 to 6. That these seven churches are loved. They are washed. They are made. So their position in salvation is sure, guaranteed, and sealed. So that means whatever warnings he will be saying has nothing to do with salvation. Pay attention. Revelation 1.11 Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book. And send it under the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Simna, Pergamos, Theatra, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So with this understanding, let us proceed now to examine the letters written to the churches. Let's begin with the letter to the church in Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. Unto the angel of the church... Of Ephesus write this thing saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In verse 1, observe the phrase, seven stars, seven golden candlesticks, Used earlier by the writer in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. Now, from John's words, the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches. The seven golden sticks are the seven churches. In the vision John saw, these stars and candlesticks were figurative. None of them was literal. Therefore, the seven candlesticks in no way was in reference to salvation because they were figurative. Neither was he referring to eternal life and neither is it the spirit of God. So the context explains this. Please be very careful in this study with figures of speech. Look at verse 2 to 3 of Revelation chapter 2. 
I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. So the Lord commended them for their labor, patience, and their zero tolerance with which they have exposed evil and false apostles. Now in Revelation chapter 2 verse 2 to 3 where we read, there's a word they are called tried. The word tried is from the Greek word perazo. P-E-I-R-A-Z-O, which implies to make foolproof or to expose perazo. In other words, the teaching in that local church, just like our church here, exposed false apostles and false prophets. The teaching. That's why this message is hated by so many people, including ministers, bishops. Because what this message does is it is light. It exposes evil agenda. You know, it exposes wrong motives. It exposes. It's like the, the so-called prosperity gospel that has been peddled very big all over the world where you are only made to feel that you are close to God when something financial happens. And that thing financial cannot happen until you bribe God with a sacrifice or something. Making God look Less than what you should look. Meanwhile, there is nothing we have given. And there is nothing we have that we have not received. It's of his fullness that we all have received. But so, this teaching exposes all those pseudo gospels. It exposes them and puts them where they belong. Alright? Now, in other words... The teaching in that local church exposed false apostles and preachers. Then look at this. He says, them which say, all right, them which say, implying that these false apostles had a doctrine. A doctrine that says, when praises go up, blessings comes down. That's fraud. Blessings don't come down because praises go up. We are blessed in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Another of those false things that are peddled in the church. When you show a sacrifice, it moves God. God moves when he sees your money. When God sees offering, he changes his mind. Those are fraudulent teachings. God does not react. God proacts. For God to react with me, he's not God. Ahead of time, he saw. He already provided salvation before the foundation of the world. The lamb was slain before the foundation. God does not react. He proacts. Before praises went up, blessings already came. Before you gave, God gave you. After all, you can't woodwin God. He is God. So they expose such teachings because they are doctrines. They are false. So when he said they have found them to be liars, it was in relation to their doctrine or in reference to their doctrine. Because what they teach, all those kind of things I gave example of. The Lord will visit you. Divine visitation 2018 is fraud. Fraud. How can Jesus, who is God, who lives inside the believer, be visiting the believer from where? Where did he go to that he will visit me? Jesus said, I and my father will come into you. And make our abode in you. I will live, not visit. I will live in them. So the day you got born again, the totality of God came to take up permanent residence on your inside. That's why we say the believer is God's heaven. You know, statements like anointing service. It's another fraudulent teaching. Where you have to line up and a so-called man of God will carry a jar of oil. And anoint you. No man of God anoints you. The anointing which you have received. <laughs> the anointing is not a service. It's a person. His name is Christ. The word Christ is the word Christos. The anointed one 
and his anointing. The anointing is not bottle. The anointing is not oil. It's a person. Christ, the anointed one. When you got born again, he, the anointed one with all his anointing, came to live on your inside. So if the anointed one with all his anointing is inside you, why do you need an extra bottle of oil to be rubbed on your head? Why? Now watch. The anointing oil, before it is rubbed on people by the people that use it, they pray over it in Jesus' name. Why will I allow you pray in the name of the person living inside me over an external oil with manufacturer date and expiry and rub it on my head? That is what Brother Paul was saying. It perishes with the using. That oil ends when you clean it. But you have an eternal oil abiding. So anointing is not a service. It's the person of Christ. And it's in you. The hope of glory. But you see, those are doctrines peddled in the church. And used to collect your money. And that is why when this teaching that you are hearing now begins to enter the church world. It exposes these false prophets and these false apostles. And compared to the doctrine of Christ, those teachings are a lie. The revelation of John to the church at Ephesus, they were told that they could discern false doctrine. Now in verse 4, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Could you hear somebody saying, what about brother James who said anointing the sick with oil? Remember the Jewish people culturally were given to using olive oil because of its medicinal value. And because it was part of their culture and James was a Jew and he was speaking to a Jewish audience. That's why in healing, he asked them to use oil. But if you pay attention carefully, he didn't say the oil will heal. He said just put oil on them, but the prayer of faith will heal the sick. How did Jesus say, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover? No oil application. In my name, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And the only instance where oil was asked to be used in the epistles was James who told the Jewish audience. Paul didn't talk about oil. John, Peter, none of them talked about oil. Why? The oil abides on your inside. John says you have an unction. He didn't say you will have. You have already an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 to 5, he pointed their attention to an important fact concerning their works. Not salvation. Their works. Works. I know thy works. Thy works. Verse 5. I know thy works. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works. What did he mean by Thou hast left thy first love. He explains what he means further in verse 5. Remember from whence thou art fallen and repent. And do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Except thou repent. Now, he used the word repent twice. Repent is translated from the Greek word metanoa, which implies to think differently or a change of thinking or to reconsider. It was gotten from two words, meta and noah. Meta means to turn to or from, to turn to or turn from. Noah, noah refers to the mind, thinking or understanding. So the writer used it 12 times in this book. Repent. He used it 12 times in this book. And chapter 2 and 3, he used it 9 times in chapter 2 and 3. So the frequency of the use of the word necessitates understanding what it means and why it was used. It was also used in the synoptic gospels. Repent and repentance. And I'd like us to look at it. Please pay attention to that word repent and repentance. Because that's what he asked them to do. And we need to know 
in what area this church is because in the two chapters two and three where the seven churches are enumerated nine times repent 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 so what is this word repent now the word metanoa was used severally in the synoptics john never used it in fact in his account he never used the word repent once let's see a few of the usage of that word repent matthew chapter 3 verse 2 and saying repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand matthew 4 17 from that time jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now let's look at mark's account because he will now shed light mark will shed light on the meaning mark 1 14 to 15. now after that john was put in prison jesus came into galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of god and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel in the above where we just read observe firstly that jesus was preaching the gospel so to repent is to believe the gospel to believe the gospel the kingdom of god which he preached in verse 14 is to believe in a message that was preached and heard so repentance there implies to believe in a message which was preached and heard this explains why john never used the word repent why because john used the word believe believes or believe thee luke chapter 10 verse 12 to 13 but i say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for sodom than for that city woe unto you chorazin woe unto you Bethsaida! for if the mighty works had been done in tar and sidon which had been done in you they had a great while ago repented sitting in sackcloth and ashes of course the background of that story is in luke chapter 10 verse 1 to 5 after these things the lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself will come therefore said he unto them the harvest truly is great but the laborers are few pray therefore the lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest go your ways behold i send you forth as lambs among wolves carry neither post nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way and into whatsoever house you enter first say peace be to this house but into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not go your ways out into the streets of the same and say even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us we do wipe off against you now we stand in being sure of this that the kingdom of god is come nigh unto you the lord sent his disciples to preach and so the repentance he spoke of is in verse 13. he said in verse 13 that their repentance will be towards the gospel that is preached that's why in luke 10 16 he that heareth you heareth me and he that despiseth you despiseth me and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me Hearet was translated from the Greek word akoa, a k o u o, which implies to give heed to a message. So the gospel of the kingdom is about Christ. He that hears and believes, that is repentance. While unbelief in the gospel is unrepentance. Therefore, repentance in the gospels is to believe the message to repent is not to change your behavior is to believe the gospel in the context of the synoptic gospels to repent is to believe the gospel luke 16 30 and he said nay father abraham but if one went unto them from the dead they will repent luke 16 27 to 29 then he said i pray thee therefore father that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that they may testify unto them. Lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him. They have Moses and the prophets. 
Let them hear them. Let them hear. Was translated from the Greek word akoa, which implies to heed a message. So repentance in the Gospels is a response to a message. It is to be persuaded by a message. A response to a message. Repentance. All right? So, we are still traveling. We're going to look at the word repentance in the epistles. And then we shall look at how it is applied in Revelation. So, we understand what he was telling the church at Ephesus and all the other churches when he asked them to repent. But friends, there's an exciting adventure as we study the book of Revelation. If you're a believer of Christ, jump on your feet. Glory to God. Lift your right hands to heaven. Say with me, I am loved by God. I am washed by God. I am made a king and a priest unto my God. Now shout it very loud at the top of your voices. I am God's dwelling place. I am God's permanent abode. I am God's heaven. Glory to God. Lift your right hand. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice today that these words by revelation will unlock our understanding. That your people are being equipped, they are being built up every day in the knowledge of Christ. I rebuke sickness, I rebuke disease and the oppression of the enemy. And I command the life of God to keep flowing through you. I decree that this revelation grows big in your heart until nothing else matters. Thank you, Father. We give you praise for answer prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says amen on a note of finality. Glory! Amen! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service. I know you've been blessed by the word of his grace. Please, don't go away. Don't go away. The essence of the teaching of God's word is to build you up, equip you, so you can do the work of ministry. That's the whole essence. Not just to acquire knowledge and see now, but to teach you so you can teach others. Brother Paul says, the things that you have learned of me among many witnesses, the same you commit to others who shall also commit to others. Two things. Number one, if you don't belong to a Bible teaching church where the message of Christ is taught, where the revelation of Jesus is brought to you, then you either join one of our campuses or you can begin one in your community and become the lighthouse for other believers to assemble around and be fed and be taught the word. And today you want to join either a campus of ours or you want to start a campus. All you need to do is shoot me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com with your details. We shall get in touch with you and we shall walk with you, equip you, and train you. And we shall walk you through establishing a campus or being a part of one of our already existing campuses in your locality. Lastly, I've written a number of books to address doctrinal issues and to answer questions that you might have. They're on the screen right now. Today, if you require any of those books, you want to order for them, or all of them, or you want to order for our CDs or DVDs, shoot a mail also to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com requesting for the materials and our office will get in touch with you and see how they can work out getting the books to wherever you are around the world. I'm excited that I'm able to be a blessing to you today. Remember, I'm live here on Facebook every morning at 10 a.m. GMT plus one, 12 noon GMT plus one, 6 p.m. GMT plus one, and 10 p.m. GMT plus one. Many times a day, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, equipping you because we want you to come to a place of robust understanding of an effective relationship between you and God. Share with other people as you look forward to continuing to be a blessing in your life. And until I see you in the next broadcast, enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. Stay.